Ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank the organizers for giving me the possibility to present or to talk about the Slovenian experience during the First World War. And I would like uh, to thank Maria Schmidt for a lovely present she gave me just before this panel. And I have to say it's really rewarding to be a, <clears throat> a woman relator at this conference. Slovenian participation in the Great War is a classical case study, <clears throat> since even the most superficial consideration of the roles in which the inhabitants of Slovenian provinces found themselves at the beginning of the World War provides firm evidence to support the thesis of their complete involvement in various combat and non-combat situations. Military engagement. Um, numerically far smaller than that of the great European nations was all the most devastating for the Slovenian national community as a whole. The Slovenes mostly served in the Austro-Hungarian uh, army and they fought on the all Austro-Hungarian fronts. The Venetian Slovenes, citizens of the Kingdom of Italy, were mobilized into the Italian army and the Austro-Hungarian citizens of Slovenian, Croatian, and Serbian nationalities joined the Serbian Air army um, to prevail in the struggle for the creation of a new Yugoslav state. In order to undermine Austria-Hungary, volunteer troops were also organized in North America. And what was the Slovenian share in the Austro-Hungarian war campaign? Most Slovenian soldiers served in 50 joint Austro-Hungarian and half of joint Austro-Hungarian infantry regiments. Some of them were considered as Slovenian regiments as they were composed by a big share of the Slovenian soldiers. As indicated in Austria's Austrian official reports, Slovenian soldiers, I quote, never lacked the devotion to make the greatest sacrifice to the last. Slovenian young men are found in every battlefield shedding blood for their beloved country, end of quote. Out of um, 100 soldiers in the Imperial Royal Army, as much as 25 was German and two Slovenes. On the list of commissioned officers, there were five Slovenian officers on active service and eight Slovenian reserve officers out of 1,000 men but the exact number of Slovenian soldiers who joined the battle for God, homeland, and the emperor in the Austro-Hungarian military uniform is still unknown. Some estimates indicate that 160,000 Slovenes served the Austro-Hungarian army during the whole period of the Great War. In terms of military competence, Germans, South Slavs, and Hungarians ranked highest which was also confirmed by the post-war statistics of their bloodshed. Taken, into, uh, taken in relative numbers, the highest blood tax am among about half 0.2 million fallen Austro-Hungarian soldiers was paid by the Slovenian Carinthia, with 36 fallen soldiers per thousand inhabitants. The Austrian average amounted to 23.33 per and the Hungarian average reached 25.7. As suggested by rough estimates, 45,000 fallen soldiers came from Slovenian provinces. According to the Yugoslav 1921 census, there were 11,000 Slovenian war invalids in the new Yugoslav state, which represented the 15.4% of all disabled war veterans even though Slovenia counted only 8.5% of entire Yugoslav population. In the Slovenian part of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, one-fifth of, Slo of Slovenian families faced long-term consequences of the war. At the outbreak of the Great War on 3rd August 1914, as we all know, Italy declared its neutrality. Both the central empires and the intent powers conducted secret diplomatic negotiations in effort to swing Italy to their side. The latter ultimately succeeded in their purpose on the 26th of April by signing a secret agreement with Italy, the so-called 
Treaty of London promising, among other, all, all um, Austro-Hungarian territories, including Slovenian territories. On 23rd of May 1915, Italy declared war to Austria-Hungary, and former allies opened yet another European battlefield, the Southwestern or Italian Front. A very important battlefield between Italy and Austria-Hungary, we used to say the most important, was a 90-kilometer-long southern branch of the front that cut into the Slovenian ethnic territory from the high mountains in the northwest to the Adriatic Sea, the so-called Izonzo, or in Slovene, Socha Front. At the dawn of 24 May 1915, Italy made his first offensive move, the so-called Il Primo Balzo, in which it occupied Slovenian territory on the right bank of the Socha River. The Socha, as we all know, was the stage of 2012 offensive in which 11 were unleashed by the Italian army and the last one by the Austria, Austrian and German forces, after which the front somehow withdrew from the Slovenian territory. The battles on the Socha took around 1.5 million casualties, around 90, uh, 100 and 190,000 of whom were fallen soldiers. According to some estimates, the Socha battlefield took lives of around 3,000 Slovenian men. The totality of uh, war unleashed its destructive potential most effectively on border areas, where the national identity of these territories came most to the fore. The civilian population was either occupied or exiled. The beginning of hostilities on the Socha front unleashed a widespread migration movement of the civilian population in retreat from the advancing Italian army to the so-called redeemed provinces and the occupation of ethnic territories that did not belong to Italy but were nevertheless regarded as its crucial strategic and security asset. The Austro-Hungarian government evacuated the Slovenian population in the interior of the Slovenian lands, as well as to the refugee camps in Lower Austria, while around 12,000 Slovenes were transported to the Kingdom of Italy. The Italian army occupied a part of Slovenian territory to the right side of the front and organized the administration of public life. Thus, they introduced the Italian as official language, the Italian school system, the Italian monetary and tax system. On the other hand, they introduced a very effective social and health policy, which were of great importance for the civilian population during the war times. The main goal of a very accurate and effective Italian administration in the occupied territories was a gradual preparation for the future annexation to the Kingdom of Italy. The war in the Socha uh, left um, in its trail indescribable devastation, a sheer ecological and economic disaster. And the preparations for the reconstruction began as early as in 1916 and continued after the Italian retreat from the Slovenian territory. World War I did not spare anyone. The everyday life and private life of the Austro-Hungarian citizens during World War I was affected by the repression of a special wartime regime that became, became known, at least in Slovenia, as military absolutism. The Austrian military and civil authorities attempted to use military absolutism as a tool for internal consolidation of the state and mobilize the population to take to the battlefields, suppress any form of anti-militarism and exert pressure on everyone and everything that would raise suspicion or incite controversy, especially within non-German national movements, including the Slovenian. The imperial decree of 21st July 1914 gave the commander-in-chief of the Austro-Hungarian army special authorities to issue ordinances and orders across provincial presidencies for the sake of protecting military interests. This decree applied to the territories in the immediate rear of the front line. Following Italy's declaration of war, this meant all provinces that constituted Slovenian territory. 
as the Slovenian provinces became subject to a special regime of the so-called military battlefield area in which military authority was empowered to appoint a summary court-martial to try civilians. With the, uh, with the advent, of, advent of war absolutism, the Austrian half of the monarchy suffered a complete breakdown in political life. The Viennese parliament was not in, in session and the fundamental civil rights were abolished. And it was already before the onset of the First World War that some Slovenian, Croats and Serbian politicians fled from, from the monarchy to the neutral Italy, Italy as we heard already yesterday. The circumstances in the otherwise paralyzed political situation in the monarchy changed with the signing of the secret London Pact. Political emigrants founded the Yugoslav Committee, which was to manage in collaboration with the Serbian government the propaganda campaign to unite Southern Slavs into a single state, and Ivo Banac yesterday spoke about it uh, widely, so I won't repeat himself. The program of the Yugoslav Committee envisaged the liberation of the Austro-Hungarian Southern Slavs and their unification with the kingdoms of Serbia and Montenegro into a single state, which was a com in complete opposition to Italy's aspirations in the Adriatic Sea as well as the London Pact. In July 1917, the Serbian government and the Yugoslav Committee signed a call for declaration. The unification, according to the declaration, was to be based on the unity of, the na of one nation with three names and implemented in accordance with the principle of self-determination in the territory inhabited by the said nations. All citizens of the new state were to be equal as were all the three national names and religions and both alphabets. The constitution of the new state was to be adopted by the two-thirds two of uh, the constitutional assembly, which didn't happen after uh, the unification. In the spring 1917, following the death of Emperor Francis Joseph and the inauguration of the new emperor, Charles I, the political atmosphere in the Habsburg monarchy somehow became calmer. The Viennese parliament was convoked again for the end of May 1917, and even before that, the leading Slovenian and Croatian parties, um, the Pan-Slovenian People's Party and the Croatian Party of Right, opted for the Slovenian-Croatian unification. The Southern Slav deputies in the national parliament united in the Yugoslav club, appointing the Slovenian deputy, Dr. Anton Koroshec, as its president. On the eve, uh, evening of 29 May, they passed a programming declaration on the national political demands of the Habsburg Slavs, Southern Slavs. The so-called May Declaration is still considered one of the most important national political programs of the Slovenes in the 20th century. It demanded that all territories of the monarchy inhabited by Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs should be united on the basis of the national principle and Croatian state law into an independent and democratic state body under the scepter of the Habsburg dynasty. The primary role of the so-called Habsburg provision was to protect the, the proposals from persecution as the declaration rejected the Austro-Hungarian du dualistic system. However, while all Slovenian political parties unanimously signed the May Declaration, the demands stated therein were accepted neither by the government nor by the emperor, and the de declaration gradually became the minimum demand of the Slovenes, which gained broad support across the Slovenian territory and engendered a widespread declaration movement which the government authorities could not suppress. In August 1918, the activities of the liberation of, um, the, towards the liberation of the Slovenes continued with the founding of the National Council, no, not yet, <clears throat> for Slovenian provinces, which became the supreme political representative body whose responsibility was to form Slovenian statehood as part of the future Yugoslav state. On October the 4th, 1918, Austria-Hungary asked the US for peace called on the American president to intercede in the peace negotiations and adopted Wilson's plan for peace. 
However, the US intervention in the set peace initiative would also entail the pre preservation of the monarchy and the rejection of the point regarding the self-determination of its nations. Emperor Charles thus issued a federal manifesto entitled To My Loyal Austrian Peoples, in which he proposed a federal arrangement of the Austrian part of the monarchy, pursuant to which each nation would establish its own state community while granting a special status to the city of Trieste. The manifesto thus rendered impossible any attempt of the Southern Slavs to unite in a single state within the monarchy. The peace initiative was ultimately rejected on the 28th of October 1918, and the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister announced that the monarchy was not going to object Wilson's positions regarding the rights of the Austro-Hungarian nations to self-determination. In the meantime, the Habsburg Southern Slavs had preparations underway for the realization of their self-determination, and on uh, the beginning of October 1918, founded the National Council of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs in Zagreb. The National Council was the supreme political representative body which gradually took over the functions of government. On 29th of October, the state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs was proclaimed at Drula in Ljubljana in front of 30,000 people. In the ensuing days, the Slovenian state apparatus was established even before its Austrian counterpart was completely abolished. The National Guards military units um, of, the new gen, uh, of the new state that emerged from the Slovenian parts of the homecoming units of the Austro-Hungarian army were, t were, t were taking over the military authority and Slovenian self-determination was fully realized on the 31st of October, when National Council uh, in Zagreb formed its own government for the Slovenian part of the state of the Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. In November 1918, the territory of the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs was truncated after the Italian army occupied the Slovenian and Croatian territories under the London Pact. The question of borders was one of the most burning issues of the new state, as well as of the future state community. What did the state legal independence of the state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs, and later unification into kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, mean for the Slovenes? In the confederatory state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs, the Slovenes asserted themselves as a sovereign nation with its own national government. The ter territory inhabited by the Slovenes was politically and administratively united, excluding the occupied Slovenian territory in the West. Nevertheless, this was the first partial realization of the program of the United Slovenia from 1848 in Slovenian history. The transition from the Habsburg monarchy to Yugoslavia was a transition to a nation state which was now nowhere as evident as in the spheres of culture and education. Slovene became the official language and the most important acquisition in the field of culture was the immediate Slovenization of cultural institutions. And the most remarkable, um, the most remarkable achievement of the period was undoubtedly the founding of the first Slovenian university in Ljubljana, which was of enormous symbolic and material cultural significance during the entire, entire period of the first Yugoslavia. The building of their own state and its cultural institu institutions brought about a concentration of intellectual powers that were previously scattered across the monarchy. On the 1st of December, the unification of state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs with the kingdoms of Serbia and Montenegro reached its concluding stage. The independence of the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs was not preserved. And the Yugoslav government began centralizing the state, which was a heavy blow for the Slovenes, who thus lost both administrative autonomy and national statehood. Nevertheless, according to the majority of Slovenian historians, the transitions from the Habsburg to the Karadžorđević dynasty with the short interim period of the independent state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs had more positive than negative effects. 
Due to the international situation, the disintegration of, of Austria-Hungary led its way to the dismemberment of the Slovenian ethnic territory, which was surely one of the most negative consequences besides the di direct aftermath of the war. In a similar vein, one may consider as negative the consequences that affected the Slovenian national struggle, which the Slovenian fought united during the Habsburg period and split into two camps in the Yugoslav era. And also, they had to somehow, somehow leave behind the memory of their Habsburg past. The transition from one state framework to another was important above all from the psychological point of view. Since the Slovenes made a major cultural and economic progress from the lower part of the development scale in Austria-Hungary to its top in the new created Yugoslav state, which however did not reflect in their political power. And let me conclude with the words of the Slovenian priest about the outcome of the war. He said, the facet of war, losses incur incurred by all sides, lost fathers, lost mothers, sons and daughters, lost faith in human righteousness. Thank you very much for your attention.